You probably noticed there was a kind of emphasis on the priest Melchizedek, both in today's first reading, but also in the responsorial psalm. And um, I wanted to draw your attention to that. So who is this figure? Who is Melchizedek? He appears in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. And Abraham wants to free his nephew Lot, who was captured by various kings. So Abraham undertakes a battle against these kings, a number of kings or kingdoms, and he's victorious. And on his return, he is met by the priest Melchizedek. And it mentions in the scriptures that Melchizedek has no genealogy. And some speculate that perhaps Melchizedek is a kind of um, manifestation of God, a manifestation of the Son of God, kind of a prefigurement to Christ. And others argue that, no, he was an actual historical figure. It's just they don't know his genealogy. Nevertheless, he's a, a very mysterious figure because the word Melchizedek means um, king of righteousness. And to be a king of righteousness, it's kind of like being God. And one of his titles also is that he is king of Salem, which is where we, they get the word shalom. So he's the king of peace. So God is the king of peace. God is the king of righteousness. But anyways, um, he blesses Abraham. And he, he also, it also states that he is priest of, of God most high. So a reference to the true God. So he's the priest of God Most High. Melchizedek is priest of God Most High. He blesses Abraham, and he also offers him bread and wine, which, of course, we know is very significant. So in the Mass, we uh, offer bread and wine, and it's transformed. It becomes the body and blood of Christ. So it, it definitely seems to be a um, Christ figure, a reference to Christ. So when it talks about... Christ being a high priest according to the order, order of Melchizedek, part of what is implied is that Christ really has no beginning. He has no end like this strange figure Melchizedek. And so he's of the same order. And it's a reminder to us that Jesus is God. He exists from all eternity. Now notice how it mentions that the, the regular priests, you know, they have to offer sacrifice for their own sins, but because of their own sinfulness, they're able to have compassion for others who are also sinners. In the case of Christ, he is sinless. He doesn't offer sacrifice for himself. He offers a sacrifice on our behalf, but he is able to have compassion because he lives amongst us as one of us. He knows what it is to be tired, to be hungry, to, to be harassed by, by others and persecuted and, and all these things. So he's able to relate to us. Also noteworthy is that after this encounter with um, Melchizedek, Abraham offers him a tenth of everything. Once again, the Jewish tradition, you know, kind of the beginnings of it here, of, of giving sacrifice to God, which is partially alluded to in today's gospel reading on the topic of fasting. So fasting is a, is a form of sacrifice, but there's many benefits to fasting. And one of them is that it helps us to focus more on God and it enables us to have strength to say no to our passions, to our sensual desires, whether it's for food or something that might be inappropriate or sinful. So many benefits to fasting. I only mentioned just a couple of them. And, you know, what's interesting is that it, it points out that the disciples of John, as well as the, the Pharisees, they fasted. Now, fasting is supposed to help to make us better persons. So here are these Pharisees, and they fast, and, you know, they do all these things, and yet they lack charity. And so there's something clearly wrong there. So we have to be careful in, and to realize that, you know, some of these things, such as fasting, it's a means to an end. It's not an end in and of itself. Just because somebody fasts, it doesn't mean they're a good person. And some people think that, oh, I'm fasting, therefore I must be good, I must be holy. Well, no. The true test of holiness is our love. 
first and foremost, love of God. Secondly, love of neighbor. Now, part of the reason I bring this up is because sometimes, you know, the church encourages us to fast, but sometimes when people fast, they become very irritable and they lose their cool. They, they become more angry and, and they, they just, you know, blow up. And, and, you know, that's partially because they're suffering, they're deprived of food, they're tired, and it's kind of a struggle. Now, when, when a person fasts, they're going to experience some of those negative effects, such as tiredness and perhaps being a little bit more irritable, but they need to have that self-control. If a person lacks that self-control, then maybe they're taking their fasting too far. In other words, maybe they need to eat a little bit just so they're not going to be so irritable. In other words, the whole purpose of fasting is to help us to grow closer to God and to our neighbor to grow in love. And if we're going to lose our cool, well, that's not really helping us then. So in other words, God wants us to use prudence when we undertake various disciplines in the church, such as fasting. And of course, the reference to the unshrunken cloth and, and the wine and, and fresh wineskins, basically Christ is saying you have to have a new way of seeing things. He's saying this to the Pharisees and those who are asking him about fasting. And so the whole point of, of fasting is to get us closer to God. And he points, you know, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? And the answer is no. So in other words, the disciples were close to our Lord. They were already sacrificing things in order to grow close to him. So fasting is a form of sacrifice. Coming to church this morning is a sacrifice for many of you, right? So these are things that we give up for the sake of God. And yes, perhaps we need to do more. You know, the question of, of tithing also. So in the Catholic Church, I recently uh, spoke to somebody about fasting and did some research on it. And there were periods in the Catholic Church when Catholics were required to tithe, to give 10% of their income to the church. And of course, with the Jewish tradition, we, we know that they gave 10% to the temple. So it's not something that Catholics have to do. The position of the Catholic Church is that People should give generously, and St. Paul talks about that. So St. Paul doesn't emphasize tithing, but he says, be generous. And, and in our generosity, God sees our generosity, and he will reward us. So be a cheerful giver. But also the church understands that some people, they are having financial difficulties. And, you know, if somebody can't pay their bills, well, we want them to be able to continue to live in their home or, or to continue to have heating. You know, we would rather not have, you know, their offering than have them go, um, you know, without a home or, or heat or, or whatever it may be. So it's, it's, it's an attitude of charity, and charity is the most important thing. So charity is, the, is the, the virtue, we could say, that encompasses all the laws of the church. Charity is the overriding principle for all things. So we, when we uh, employ the virtue of prudence, you know, we have to think charitably. What is the charitable thing to do? So the, what we should take away from all of this is we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our sufferings, Christ so he wants to help us. He does help us. But we also need to be like Abraham who offered something to God. We make many offerings, the prayers, coming to church, um, even, even your financial donations, all these things. These are all offerings. And we make sacrifices in order to be closer to God. And sometimes we're too attached to certain things. And those are especially the things that we may want to consider sacrificing. But um, the question is, you know, should we be sacrificing more? Can we do more to draw closer to God, perhaps even fasting if it is, if we feel that it will be beneficial for us? So things for us to reflect on.